Hi, welcome. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Kimberly. I am the worship coordinator here at PFC. Um, and I am so excited to be able to speak to you guys today, um, just carrying on with our message of Luke. Um, when we were planning out some, some of the stuff this year, uh, I kind of saw this portion of scripture and was like, ooh, I want it. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, John, uh, it's mine. Um, so, yeah, so we're, we've been working through the Gospel of Luke um, throughout this year, and so we're finishing off today with the uh, sixth chapter of Luke. Um, we've been walking through in each section of Luke. Um, we've seen Jesus laying out the way in which we are supposed to live our lives, right? Um, he's spoken characteristics that he finds compelling. Uh, he's given us guidance in what looks like the Jesus way. What does the Jesus way look like? Um, we see him calling uh, his 12 disciples and starting that disciple journey and that ministry of building relationships with the people that he would eventually um, send out into the world. We see him calling the least of these and giving guidelines for what right living looks like. Um, we've seen him uh, say, rejoice when you're persecuted. That's a pretty difficult pill to swallow. You know, um, but Jesus kind of shows us what that looks like. Um, we've also seen him call attention to listen up. Listen up. Um, he access, asks us to extend grace to those who have proven time and time and time again that they really need that grace. Um, and we learned last week uh, that Jesus is the hope of the world, right? Jesus is the hope and beacon of love in the world, and that, you know what, sometimes the Christian way is not actually the Jesus way. Um, we learn that sometimes um, we walk and live as Christians and live our lives in a way that doesn't actually line up with Jesus and the Jesus way and him being the hope and the love of the world. Uh, we learn that language is used as a gift and a tool to build others up and not tear others down. Um, we learn that we, as human beings on this earth and as image bearers of God, have the potential to bring shalom and to bring peace and to bring connection into this world that is full of dissonance, disconnection, and disorientation. Um, or... <laughs> We have the potential to contribute to that dissonance, disconnection, and disorientation. Uh, and that leads us all up to where we are today. We're at Luke 6, and we're going to finish off Luke 6 with uh, verse 46 to 49. Um, so if you have your Bible, I encourage you to turn to Luke chapter 6, uh, verses 46 to 49. And I'm going to read it here. Um, now, I have uh, an NLT version of the Bible, uh, but it's pretty close and similar to NIV, but let's read it together. Luke chapter 6, verse 46 to 49. Why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the flood waters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it was well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse in a heap of ruins. So there's two scenarios happening here. Um, and there's like little pieces that have kind of broken down. Um, in this sermon. So in the beginning, he says that there's two people represented here. Uh, but the first thing, before we even get to him describing the two builders, he says, he kind of like calls them out in the beginning, right? He says, hey, hello, are you listening to my word? Why are you saying, Lord, Lord, and then not doing what I asked you to do? Um, I teach grade seven, so I can relate. <laughs> um, and in that time, in that time back in uh, biblical times, 
The repetition of a name also shows like that intimacy. So that ability to actually call on someone's name when they repeat it twice, it's, uh, it shows that they know who they're talking to. They really know that intimate piece um, of who they're talking to. And so they're coming to him and repeating him na his name as if they know exactly who they're talking to. They're saying, Lord, Lord, right? Um, so they're coming to him with a relationship, but then they're not doing what he actually says. Um, and he goes on to say, yo, listen up, people. Listen up. You, you're calling and coming to me like you have a relationship. I'm giving you guidance, and then you're not doing it. Um, and he says, I'm going to show you two types of people, those who listen when I speak and those who don't. And I find it really interesting that he calls them out and says, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're not listening to my word. And yet he continues to give them that word. He full and well could have said, hey, you're calling me Lord, Lord, and you're not doing what I'm, what I'm asking you to do. And he could have turned around and walked away. But instead of saying, no, I'm not going to teach you more, he's like, okay, let me, let me actually show you again. Let me show you again what I mean. Let me extend it again what I mean. Um, and he doesn't turn from him. And he teaches them knowing full well that still there are people in that crowd that are going to turn around and say again, Lord, Lord, because they haven't done what he's asked them to do. Right? And so I find that piece interesting how Jesus still comes to us even though we know he knows that we're not going to follow through and he still comes at us and says, hey, let me give you more guidance. Let me show you what right living looks like. Let me extend that grace. Let me extend that kindness. Let me show you how to bring that shalom into the world, um, even though we cause that dissonance. Uh, and then he moves on. So he gives that actual explanation of the two builders. He says there's a man building a house who dug deep down, laid its foundation on rock. When a flood came down, torrent struck that house, but it couldn't be shaken because it was well built. There is one who hears my words and doesn't put them into practice, and he's like a man built on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck, the house collapsed, and it was the destruction was complete. There are shapes in architecture that make a strong building, that make a strong structure. Um, we know that triangles make really strong bridges, right? They're able to with withstand um, different pressures than other shapes. Um, when you think about a house, what makes a house the strongest that it can be? A good foundation. Yeah. Um, I have talked with people who have bought houses before, uh, and they say when they're looking at a house, the first thing you check is the foundation. Everything else can be fixed. You can fix paint. You can fix plumbing. You can fix um, electrical. You can fix roofs. You can fix walls. But if you got a foundation that is not solid, it is a heck of a time trying to fix that, right? And so that's the first thing that you look at when you're going to go buy a new house. Not like I'm someone who's ever bought a house or a contractor, but from what I know, you check the foundation, right? And if it's not a good foundation, uh, you're not going to buy that house, right? Um, there are things that you actually need to do when you're setting a foundation. Um, you need to dig down really deep into the ground uh, to, for foundation to be poured. There needs to be proper grading um, at a certain slope uh, for the house. Um, and there are certain depths that undisturbed soil uh, of undisturbed soil when the foundation can be poured. There's even a load-bearing percentage that needs, to ha uh, that needs to be calculated based on the type of soil that it's going to be built on and the type of building that you're going to actually build. So there's all of these steps that go into even just pouring the foundation of a brand new house. Um, and then once you have all of the specifications right, then you can put in the concrete and the rebar metal, and uh, it solidifies, and then you can finally actually build your structure on that solid foundation. That's a lot of work before you can even start building a house, right? Um, and that foundation is specifically designed for that specific structure. So Jesus is painting that picture here. He's saying that his people actually hear his word, and then they actually go and build their life on his word. They're actually putting them into practice. 
they're not just hearing the word and walking away from it. They're, they're hearing the word and building their life on it. That's an action piece to it, right? They're actually doing it. They've done the work. They've built a strong foundation. They have cleared away some of the muck that was there before. They've dug down deep. They've done the slope and the grading. They've poured the right foundation. They've decluttered everything. And they've poured the foundation of Jesus, and they're living out his word. That's the picture that he's painting of that person who hears the word and actually puts it into practice. On the flip side, we have that person who hears Jesus' words and doesn't put them into practice. They don't even build a foundation. They see a piece of ground, and they just plop their house right on top. They don't clear away the junk. You don't know what they're building on. They don't clear away the soil. They don't clear away the stuff. They just build their house. And as soon as those outside forces start to act on that house, done, destroyed completely. They, it says the destruction is complete. There's nothing holding that structure firm at its base. There's nothing grounding that structure to, to be able to withstand the forces that enact on it. So, I mean, this is a story that a lot of us have heard, right? Um, Jesus is saying, have our foundation fully built on his word and his teachings in order to have a house built strong that's going to withstand the outside forces that will come. Those outside forces are going to come. Um, and they're going to come and destroy because that's the nature of the world of the dissonance and disconnection and disorientation that we're living in. They're going to try its best to tear down our house. And if our foundation isn't built to the certain specifications, our house is coming crumbling down. When I was preparing for this sermon, um, my mind continually thought about, well, what would it actually be like if my house of faith was built as I was growing up? What if... It was built when I was a child. Do I trust a child to build my house to the proper specifications and building codes? No. No. I don't even let them build Django when we play. Because it's not as tight, like, as tight as I want it to be. And I, like, I, there's a, I'm a Jenga freak. It's fine. Um, but, yeah, I'm not going to trust a child to build my house with the proper codes and specifications. Because that's not in their wheelhouse. That's not what they're... That's not, what, that's not their job, right? Um, and so often in church culture, uh, or at least in my experience of church culture, um, huh? is it working? Cool. Thank you. Um, just remind me if it happens again. <laughs> uh, often in my experiences of church culture, uh, I grew up in the church. I had a dad as a youth pastor. Um, I went to church twice a week, at least. Uh, we were heavily, heavily, heavily involved in the church. I started leading worship bands when I was, oh gosh, I think like 16. Um, so like heavily involved in the church. And uh, if you're in that position, or I was in that position, and I had kind of a faith that had been built over a long period of time when I was in very different stages of development. Um, and there's a verse, actually, we just did it as memory work a couple weeks ago with my class. Kenzie, do you know it? Oh, nice. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11 says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child, thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. Um, when I became a man, I put my childish ways behind me. Um, and that's our job, right? Like as a child, you have a specific job in your own faith journey, and it's to get to know Jesus. Um, but when you have a faith structure that's been built over time, there's going to be some childlike mind frames built into your faith structure, right? Um, we get taught these awesome Bible stories, um, and they get handed to you like a typical classic, like Sunday school stories, Noah and the ark, the rainbow, little animals going in two by two, um, David and Goliath with a slingshot, or David and his rubber ducky, you know, Esther and her bravery, the Tower of Babel, the walls of Jericho and the slushies which if you're looking at me confused, that's a VeggieTale reference. Um, 
right? So we get told these stories, and they're great. They get handed to you over and over again. And they're amazing stories. There's a reason why we tell our kids these stories. They're epic, and they're really great for kids to grasp onto. They're fun and easy, um, and not like some of those other stories in the Bible, like try explaining Hosea to teenagers. Not a good time. Um, but these epic stories are handed to you as a kid, and it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized that I have this whole faith that I know in my heart um, Jesus is there, but there's all these other stories and concepts and mind frames that I was given growing up that I used to build my tower. And, you know, some of the stories, like, they get handed to you, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's, this piece makes sense. I'm going to, that makes sense. Build my tower. Yep, that sounds good. Get, get another story. Build it. We're good. Um, and I kept building and building and building these tower, this tower as the blocks were handed to me. When I became an adult, I actually started to really read the stories on my own. And I went through this whole deconstruction process. Uh, I took a look at my tower of faith, and it looks pretty good. It's a good tower. It's impressive. It's pretty. It's really nice. Uh, but I really didn't know myself what this tower was actually built with um, or what it was even built on, really. Um, is my tower going to withstand the test of time? Is my tower going to withstand the... <laughs> tribulations and circumstances and grief and hurts and the things that the outside forces that are going to enact on, enact on my structure, is it going to stand up? Or are the outside forces going to knock it down? And as I grew up, I, I couldn't actually answer that question on my own. I, I couldn't answer um, at that time with confidence whether it would stand up. And when you start to, you know, question that or ask those kind of questions, sometimes it can be a little bit scary, but maybe sometimes that's your, like, opening wake-up call uh, to take a look at the structure. Maybe start looking at it piece by piece um, and see what it's actually built of. Um, this process is called deconstruction. Uh, it's when you start taking the pieces and the stories that you've been handed piece by piece and looking at them and... Um, holding them up to what scripture actually says. Um, it's like when you start to renovate a home, you don't just go in with a sledgehammer knowing that, uh, not knowing what's behind the walls, electrical or plumbing, or at least I hope that you don't do because that, that kind of sounds like a really bad idea, taking a sledgehammer to a house and not knowing what's in it. Um, so the only way to do the right construction is to actually take a look piece by piece. And sometimes that happens as it comes up, and sometimes it actually takes you intentionally looking through and getting into the Word and reading the stories yourself and understanding what it's like. Um, I remember a time when we were in Florida. Uh, my family used to go to Florida every year, and the one year I was reading the Old Testament, and I was reading Noah, and I came off the balcony, and I, like, stormed into the living room, and I was mad. I was so livid. Josh is giggling because he remembers. Um, I was so mad um, because I read the story of Noah and I felt like I was robbed of the whole story. I only knew Noah's piece of like the tiny little piece of the ark and the, and the animals going in two by two and the promise of the rainbow, but I didn't know the full picture. I was only handed a piece. Um, and, like, there's parts of Noah's story that you don't tell a child, and that's okay. But it wasn't until I was an adult that I was like, oh, there's so much more to the story. Or, like, um, David and his relationship with Bath Bathsheba and the ramifications of what that actually meant. I had no idea. I thought that he just loved his rubber ducky um, and had that relationship, you know. Um, and I didn't understand the full ramifications of what that meant. And... When I had that realization as an adult, it made me realize that I need to go back. If I don't know the real story of those epic stories we know and love, like Noah and David, what else have I built my tower with that I actually don't know the stories? Um, 
the concepts and the mind frames that I've been handed. I just, I didn't know the whole piece. And it's that same um, concept of, you know, when you're a child, you think like a child, you reason like a child, you behave like a child, but now I'm an adult, and I need to put those childish ways behind me and actually start taking ownership of my own relationship with Christ. And so I started to actually take apart pieces of my tower, um, piece by piece, brick by brick, um, and examining it and seeing, is this true to what the word actually says? Is this true to what Jesus is saying in his word? Um, and there were some pieces that as I picked it apart, um, I, I said, yeah, no, you know what? That doesn't actually hold up to, to this book right here. That doesn't hold up, so I'm not putting that one back. And I'd pick up another one, and I'd then read the word, and it, yeah, yeah, that holds up. That makes sense. Okay, that, that can go back on. Um, or put it in another pile to, to build my structure again. Um, and so I would take those piece by piece and step by step. Um, and I will say that I am someone who is very, very lucky, very lucky that when I did that deconstruction process, um, my foundation was solid, you know, and I know that that's not everyone's story. Um, I will say that I am lucky that I had good parents that helped me lay that solid foundation of love, of Jesus' love, um, and of knowing him fully. Um, I found a foundation that was rooted in the rebar of Christ and poured with the concrete of his love. Um, and I'm very thankful that once I peeled back the layers and the bricks and found what was underneath, I found a beautiful foundation that I could actually start building my faith on. Um, and I, I realize that not everyone's that fortunate. Um, I know stories of people who have done a deconstruction process, and in the end of it, they walked away because they, they couldn't find something that they found to be true um, in their own hearts and in their own walk. Um, and, and, and that's sad, and I'm, I'm lucky that I found like Jesus at the base of it. Um, and I can see how someone can get there, especially just being handed something and not knowing the truth, right? Um, but yeah, I just kept peeling back those layers and found Jesus, and then you start building your foundation, right? You have your foundation of Jesus and his love and his hope of the world, and then you take these stories and you, you start building your tower again. And it's that personal and in-depth relationship with God that you have that you can start building your tower again. And so I think when we um, look at the whole picture of what Luke is saying in Luke 6, uh, there's some key things that we can pull out when we look at the Sermon on the Plain and um, some key takeaways from his overarching uh, mission and his overarching teaching. Um, one of them is, are we listening to Jesus when he speaks? Are we actually listening to, listening to him when he calls us to attention and he gives us advice? Are we listening? Are we really, really listening to him? Second thing is, Jesus is the hope of the world. His way offers mercy and grace and love and kindness and peace and shalom to everyone. And anything else that is not of that hope and peace and love is not the Jesus way. And the last thing is, what type of foundation are we building on? What foundation is your, life, your walk with God built on? Is it one that has the right specifications? Is it built on Jesus' word? Do we maybe need to take a look at our foundation? Do we maybe need to take that really, really hard step of starting to actually take apart our tower? It's icky sometimes. Sometimes it feels icky. Sometimes it feels uncomfortable when you have to kind of take a piece by piece and look at those pieces of your tower. I get it. It's uncomfortable, but it's worth it. Um, do we need to do a little bit of deconstruction? Are we hearing the word, and are we actually doing it? We have to actually be doing it. It's not enough to just hear the word of Jesus. We actually have to do it. We have to live it out. We have to do what he says. I'm going to pray for you. Father God, we just thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you for um, the actions that you give us, Lord, the guidance 
uh, in our lives, Lord. We thank you for, um, yeah, stories like this where we get to kind of pick it apart and and see what's underneath, Lord. We thank you for your call to action, and we thank you that you are the hope of the world and that you are something that we can build a good and firm foundation on, Lord. Father, as we kind of take uh, away these words and we chew on them, um, Lord, I just pray that you will stir in our hearts that desire to get to know who you are and get to know you fully and get into your word and start building that foundation and start looking at our tower of faith piece by piece, Lord. Um, God, may we find something that is compelling um, and that you find compelling, Lord. May we live our lives and actually do what you ask us to do and not just merely listen to it. May we be people of faith who do what you say and actually live out those actions. In Jesus' name, amen.